What is up everyone? At the moment you are staring at the desktop of my good old faithful Mac Mini server. Well, it's just a, a normal Mac Mini from 2007. More specifically it's a 1.83 GHz Core 2 Duo model. Uh, this is a very, very nice machine. It was very generously donated by Greg Black quite a few years ago now. So Greg, if you're still watching my videos, buddy, huge thank you. Um, this Mac Mini has been pretty much switched on 24-7 for the last three years or so and it has become part of my daily workflow in pretty much every way. This is my main and only home server and it does all of my home server duties. It's done really, really well. Um, it's currently running Mac OS X Lion and that's one of the main reasons why in this video we're going to be retiring the Mac Mini server and replacing it with another mo machine that was very kindly donated. Um, if you guys haven't seen one of my recent videos, I unboxed a Mac Mini server 2009 edition that was very generously donated by Kyle. So Kyle, if you're watching as well, huge thank you. There's kind of a theme running here, folks. You know, I, I wouldn't have half of the cool stuff I have without the support of you guys. So, you know, I know I say thank you a lot and I don't want to bore anyone with my constant droning on, but, you know, it really does mean a lot to me and it allows me to make really cool videos like this one. So, in today's video, we are going to be retiring this absolute beast of a Mac Mini, 1.83 GHz. It's a gorgeous model. It is plenty, plenty powerful enough for the stuff that I do, but it is mainly support and also connectivity. They are pretty much the two reasons why I'm replacing the Mac Mini, and we'll talk about those in greater depth later on in the video. But this is just sort of like the final look at the Mac Mini desktop with all of my external drives connected and up and running. It's still doing its thing, um, still has time machine backups running through it as we speak probably um, because I time machine to various drives from my main system here and also the laptops around the house. The Mac Mini itself also time machines to another drive so you know multiple backups and whatnot and uh, yeah it does many things for me and you guys will see exactly what things it does in this video because we will be setting up my new server. So coming over here let's just have a quick look at this Mac Mini in the rack. Now, here it is, the Old Faithful sitting there. I know it's a little bit dusty, folks. What we're gonna do is do a sort of clean up of the rack video, maybe, where we'll slightly move a couple of things around and also dust it and whatnot. Um, but this is the guy that we're gonna be replacing today. It's actually quite a sad day because these sorts of upgrades are almost upgrades that I don't want to make because this is still a really reliable machine and it does everything I ask of it, but it does let me down in a couple of areas just because of its age. And you know, it's 10 years old now, so it does so, so well. And it's pretty much just software, pretty much. You know, interface does come into it as well, you know, connectivity, but pretty much just software. So today, what we're going to be doing is firing up this beast. Here is the beast that we are going to be firing up today. This is a Mac Mini 2009, but it's a special 2009 Mac Mini. This is a server edition, and the way you can tell right from looking at it is because it has no optical drive slot. This is a machine that I have wanted to own for quite some time now. It's a machine that I looked at back in the day when it came out and thought, man, that is a nice little computer. And I am finally the proud owner of one. I was very close to purchasing one of these on eBay. Um, and then Kyle came forward with the donation, which was amazing. So we're going to pop that there. I'm going to need a keyboard, monitor and mouse. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to dive straight into configuring the Mac Mini. Now, I get several questions about my use of a Mac Mini as a home server. I've mentioned it in other videos, but I just want to reiterate that I don't do anything substantially complicated on my Mac Mini. It runs a normal desktop version of Mac OS X. Uh, well, I guess Mac OS these days, um, because this will be running a much newer OS. But regardless, I just do simple things that are super simple to set up, and most of you will probably know how to set all of these things up. But the, for the few people that ask, or for, for the many people that ask, I'm gonna detail the entire configuration process, which is something that I've not done before. I've made videos about setting up my Mac Mini as a server in the past, but I've never actually shown you guys every step that I take 
to make all of those services possible to me. Now, as soon as you throw the S word in, as soon as you use the word server, it makes it sound instantly more complicated and more in depth. But all it is when you think about it is just a glorified desktop computer. It's just a little desktop that you could use, you know, every day for everyday tasks. And it just has a little bit of different configuration around the edges to make it usable as a machine that you can access on your network 24 seven to do various servery tasks for you. So we're gonna look at all of that. And instead of explaining all of the tasks that I do on my Mac mini at the beginning, what we'll do is we'll just go through the configuration and as we go through it, I'll explain why I'm configuring the things that I'm configuring. So all babbling aside, I'm gonna get this thing set up and get you guys set up so that you can see what I'm clicking on the screen. So here we are with a simple Mac mini setup. First thing I'm gonna do is boot it up. I've basically got a keyboard and a mouse and that was a weird noise and a monitor. Uh, it's also connected to the network, as you can see, which is, um, you know, necessary at this point for the configuration. So we're going to wait for this to boot up. And then what I think I'll do for a little treat, instead of faffing around with my camera, I think because this is almost into the land of a tutorial, even though I'm not going to call it a tutorial, um, I think what we'll do is screen record which will be a big treat. So before we delve into the proper configuration, the first thing that you've got to do is check for software updates. So even though this Mac mini is running the latest version of LCAP, which is the newest OS that it can run, um, at least run natively, I'm not really interested in any kind of hack way of getting a newer version of OS 10 on here because this is super new anyway. Um, even though it's running 10.11.6, there are still multiple updates. So we've got an update to iTunes, which will be important later, a security update, all sorts of things. So right at the beginning, it's important to just update the machine. And of course, you'll need to restart to update. So you want to get that out of the way at the beginning because you want minimal restarts if you're going to be using this 24 hours a day. It could introduce complications depending on what you use the Mac Mini for, what you use your server for. So getting the updates out of the way, really good idea. And then you can just pretty much sit and let it rot. Um, you know, it's completely up to you. If, you, if you're running a really modern Mac Mini that can support the newest operating systems. You'll obviously have operating system updates as and when they come every couple of months or whatever. The only time I would not recommend doing this is if you know for a fact that some kind of new update that is gonna be listed here is gonna break something that you want to use the machine for. So if there's that specific application that will not work past a certain version of Mac OS or whatever, that's when you've gotta be careful. So we can just hit restart now and the computer will restart. We'll do another scan for updates and then we can delve in. While this is installing updates, just a quick word on the hardware itself. I believe in the unboxing video I mentioned that I wanted to give the hardware some attention before putting it into my rack. This currently has the two stock 500 gigabyte drive from Apple in it. I wanted to replace them with SSDs and put them in RAID 1 for some redundancy, speed, and less power consumption, but I did not get round to that. I don't really think that I'll have the time to put SSDs into this thing and make the upgrade and think about ordering them and stuff like that. I just haven't got that kind of space in my brain at the moment. Um, so what we'll do is when I'm a little bit freer and I've got a little bit more um, brain space to think of these things, we'll order some RAM, we'll double up on RAM and we'll also order two SSDs and we'll do some fun cloning stuff so that we don't have to reconfigure the whole thing and we'll pop the SSDs in. That'll be a really fun video. Um, this will by far be fine for what I'm using it. I believe um, the other Mac Mini has two gigs of RAM and this one has four. That's right, folks, two gigs of RAM. And of course, we're upgrading um, from DDR2 to DDR3. So overall, using a much quicker machine anyway. Uh, this is 2.53 gigahertz Core 2 Duo. Um, very, very nice computer. So we're already doubling up on RAM. I was gonna put eight in here before putting it in the rack and the SSDs, but that's gonna have to wait. So big apologies if you were really looking forward to that as opposed to looking forward to the software side of things. But I promise this will be hopefully exciting to some of you. And uh, I also promise that the upgrade video is coming in the future. We'll just yank it out the rack 
and uh, and pop that stuff in when I've got some more time. Okay, so believe it or not, it has been quite some time since I recorded the last portion of the video. We've been out for lunch and stuff, so I'm fully fueled to give this little screen recording demo. Apologies if the audio is a little rough. I am indeed recording with my iPhone, and I'm just going to say right at the beginning, this is not a tutorial. It's not going to be as polished as a tutorial. I'm just going to show you guys what I do and talk you through it. Um, but I'm not going to give it the title of tutorial because, you know, that puts extra pressure. So I'm just going to show you guys what I do and hopefully some of you guys will find it useful. So first things first, here we are sitting on my Mac mini desktop. Now, the way we're going to tackle this is coming from the angle of you've used your machine previously as a normal computer and now you want to turn it into a server. I've got a Mac Mini server, it makes practically no difference, this could be any Mac Mini or indeed any Mac at all. Um, so all these steps are going to be pretty much the same and the beauty of it is OS X and most of these configuration options has been the same for years and years. Anything Tiger and up is pretty much going to apply here, so that's pretty good, apart from maybe some of the iCloud stuff that we'll run into in a minute. But anyway, let's just go through it. So first of all, what we want to do is start with a blank canvas. Now this is indeed pretty much a fresh install, but nevertheless, I want to create a completely blank canvas with stock settings. So to do that, we jump into the user's preference pane and we want to make a brand new user. We're going to do this for our server because we get a fresh start, all the default settings. It's going to make our life a lot easier and we won't get tripped up by any settings that we've forgotten halfway down the line. So of course, when making a new account, we want to click administrator. This is extremely important, at least in my case, this will be the only account on the machine once we're finished. So yeah, administrator, is, it's got to be. Um, for my servers, I don't use my actual name. I'm just going to have admin one. That's what I had with my previous server. I just don't find it necessary to have my name listed on my server. Um, I'm just quite happy being called administrator one. So a password, which I nearly said out loud. I often do that in videos. I kind of dictate what I'm doing and then nearly dictate my password. Um, I have a password that I use for my servers. It has to be pretty secure, of course, folks, because naturally, if you're sort of putting together a home server, maybe you're going to store personal information on there or whatever. So a nice secure password and then create user. So it'll take a few moments to create the user and then it will appear there, admin one. Absolutely fantastic. So that is us, job done. Um, we are completely done now in this user account. So what we need to do is log off and log back on. Of course, we do that up here, but I'm gonna to need to pause the recording. So I'll be back with you guys in just a second after logging on to the other account. So for this part, we are gonna need the camera. There is my QuickTime file that I've saved on the secondary drive. Um, we're going to log out, and the reason we're going to need a camera is going to become pretty obvious. I'm not going to keep a screen recording going through the uh, this process. I don't think you can anyway. So, admin1, that's our new account that we want to boot into. Let me just enter the password. So, password entered. We are going to be faced with quite an interesting step that is only going to apply to the last few revisions of the Mac OS. I'm not even entirely sure how many revisions of the Mac OS, but if you're using something like Snow Leopard or, you know, an OS along those lines, it won't ask you any of this. Um, but here we go, here is the main question. Sign in with your Apple ID. Do you want to use iCloud or not? If you press this one, don't log in, it'll literally skip past all of the iCloud stuff and go all the way to the end and it won't bother you at all, you'll just land straight on the desktop. But I'm gonna have to do it. And the reason for that is because I want to use this machine with iTunes and with my iTunes purchases, makes life a lot easier if I just sign into iCloud from the get-go and then disable the iCloud services that I don't want. Now, it's a bit of a pain in the ass because iCloud kind of spews a load of junk all over the place that I really don't want on my server, but we can pretty much disable most of that before it starts syncing up. There's just a few things to look out for, but I will show you those things and uh, give them to you as a warning. 
um, maybe some things that you really don't want set up on your home server. But it's easier to sign in with iCloud and just go from there. So I'm going to do that right now, and primarily because I want to use iTunes on this system, but it also makes life a lot easier when you want to use the App Store and stuff. So yeah, I, I'd say pretty much most people watching this video, if you are indeed following this as some kind of tutorial, you would want to sign in with iCloud, especially if you're part of the Apple ecosystem. If you're not part of the Apple ecosystem, then you probably won't, but it, a lot does kind of depend on various things. So anyway, I'm gonna stop babbling and just sign in. Okay, everyone, we are back in business. Now then, first thing I'm gonna do is jump straight back into system preferences, and we're basically gonna live in here for the next 10 minutes or so. So the very first thing I'm gonna do is change the desktop wallpaper to a solid color, because I find that existing wallpaper pretty jarring. But that, of course, is an optional step. That's just a lot easier on the eyes. So next thing, just another quick personal alteration. Gonna enable zooming because I may need to see things a little closer. Again, nothing to do with configuring a server, just makes life easier. And I'm using a normal PC mouse, so I'm gonna turn natural scrolling off because that's just weird. Okay, first thing that you need to do is jump into users and groups. Assuming that you don't want your other account and you've already backed up your data, we unlock the preference pane. And we go to the old account and we press the little minus. We want to delete the old home folder. You don't have to securely delete it if it's your machine and your data and stuff. It just takes forever and there's no real need. So there we go. That is that account gone. That was a really empty account. It had nothing on it. So that's why it deleted so quickly. So now we're just left with our admin one server account. And of course, you can do anything you like in here, just like a normal computer. Uh, if it was your personal machine or whatever, you can choose a nice little picture. I'm going to change the picture because there's a rather fetching one that I fancied for a little while. Even though I've been on Max for several years and this picture has been on Max for several years, I've never used it. So we're going to have the little lightning. Now then, folks, another thing that we have to do is jump into the login options. And there is something very important that we have to change in here, which is kind of like make or break for um, the usability of your Mac Mini after a power cut or something like that. Automatic login, you want to do automatic login for admin one and then type in the password. Boom. That means once your Mac Mini restarts after a power failure or whatever, or you need to reboot it, you will jump straight back into the desktop. It won't sit there at the login screen. It could be a little awkward if it did, but automatic login, much, much better for servers. At least much better for servers in your own home. And this is, all of this is based on pretty much you're going to be the only one or just sort of the main one in your family using it. This is like your own personal little server. So automatic log into your account is absolutely fine there. Of course, you'll need a password to access it from anywhere else anyway, so it doesn't make much of a difference. It just makes things easier. So we're done with login. That's pretty much all the options that we need to change in here. Very simple. Next thing that we need to change is all of our energy settings. So by default, let's have a look at the default settings. I can't even remember. So, okay, this is no good for our server. Of course, we want it running 24 hours a day. So the most important thing to do in this preference pane right now is to grab this slider and drag it to never. You never ever want your Mac to sleep because it's going to run 24 hours a day. You're going to want access to it 24 hours a day. Or at least, you know, if you're sleeping in the middle of the night, maybe you'll run some backup routines or cloning routines or something that you want to execute at two, three o'clock in the morning. It does say your computer may use more energy with these settings. We know that. We're going to hit OK. Now, the next one, display sleep. I must be honest here, folks. We're not going to have a display connected to the Mac Mini. This is what I'm referring to as a headless set up and fairly limbless as well so we won't have a monitor keyboard or mouse setup so I'm not sure whether this slider makes any difference to uh, the screen sharing options I doubt it does because it sort of wakes itself up um, into a usable state when you enable screen sharing anyway so yeah that's something to bear in mind there are a few check boxes down here and these are some interesting checkboxes. Put the hard disks to sleep when possible. This is kind of up to you. I leave it enabled because there's a lot of runtime on your hard drives 24 hours a day. I really don't mind them spinning down. A lot of people are like, oh, server environment, have the hard drive spinning up all the time. That's fair enough. But for me, I really don't mind waiting five to eight seconds for a couple of hard drives to spin up if I want to access some data. I'd rather my hard drives last longer and my power bill be smaller. So I leave 
leave that one checked as it is, but there is, a, there is a very special option in here which I enable straight away, and that is start up automatically after a power failure. Now this option, combined with the automatic login that we already set up, means that if you lose power to your Mac Mini for any reason, or it's switched off or accidentally unplugged or whatever, it means that as soon as it gets power again, it'll spring back into life, it'll log in, and then as long as you're sat at the desktop, any automated routines that you have scheduled will execute. So it basically means that your Mac Mini becomes independent. Now, even if you have this checkbox enabled, if you ignored my statements about the automatic login, it means that it won't log in. It'll just sit there at the login screen and it won't execute any of the tasks you have set up under your admin one account or under whatever your account is called. So very crucial options here in the energy saver and something to definitely keep in mind. Now there's another little option in here which may be useful to some people. If you're after a Mac mini as a server or any Mac as a server but you don't want it running 24 hours a day, there is a decently all right scheduling option within OS X. You can set it to start up and shut down at various times. I don't bother because I leave it on 24 hours a day. It's a very power efficient machine anyway. Plus, I do tend to find that if you have something running, if like if you have a backup running or whatever, then the shutdown will get interrupted anyway, of course, rightly so. And uh, the whole thing just basically turns to rubbish anyway, so it becomes pointless. Um, I try to do it with a Mac Mini at work. We've got a Mac Mini running some digital signage at work. As you guys know, I unboxed that last year sometime, I think. And uh, yeah, I just leave it running 24 hours a day now because the automatic startup and shutdown is just a waste of time. So. We've done everything that we needed to do in users and groups, everything that we needed to do in energy saver. Uh, so now we're going to jump into, I believe, the final but most important place in system preferences to set up our server, and that is the sharing preference pane. So this is where all of the magic happens. Now we're going to ignore everything apart from this box to begin with. This is a crucial box because at the moment it's called Tom Smith's Mac Mini. That is what the network will see. That is what all of your devices will list. When you want to access the server, it's going to be called Tom Smith's Mac Mini. And that's kind of crap. It's going to be called whatever your computer was called when you first set it up, your account, with just, you know, whatever it is afterwards. So if it's an iMac, it would be Tom Smith's iMac. Or if my name was Dave... Jones, it would be called Dave Jones Mac Mini. So yeah, you get the idea. We want to rename this, that's what I'm trying to say. So my previous server was called Neptune, but I've been running that server so long that I kind of think that that name is now tied to that server, but I still want to carry on with the space planet theme thing. So I think I'm going to go for Venus and to change the name of your entire computer and entire server, just press enter. And that is it. It will now all of a sudden appear on the network as Venus or whatever you have decided to call it. I may change the name later and a little point about changing the name. You can freely change the name of your server whenever you like. You won't run into many difficulties doing this. Um, if you run mainly Macs at home and you've just got Mac shares set up, it'll be fairly accepting of a name change. But just be warned that if you have saved a screen sharing session that you uh, automatically load from a shortcut or whatever, or the open menu in the screen sharing application itself, uh, if you change the name of your computer, you will have to uh, re-save a new session with the new name. But that's not a big headache at all. So, you know, new name, it's pretty much essential. So now we get into the nitty gritty and even this isn't complicated. All of this is super easy stuff, folks. First things first, we'll just go down the list in order. So screen sharing. Everything in this list is extraordinarily self-explanatory. Screen sharing means that when I tick this box, bang, I can now share the Mac Mini screen. So as I said, this is going to be completely headless, completely independent. The only things that it's going to have connected is hard drives, a printer, an internet connection, and of course power. There'll be no keyboard, mouse, or monitor. So screen sharing will allow me to see the screen that you're sh seeing now from different computers. And 
the way that it's set up by default is only these users can see it and then there's a list here you can add or remove administrators is there by default it's actually in an ideal setting already you don't have to change anything because it means that you will log in with your administrator account for the Mac mini on a different machine and then that'll allow you to share the screen even if someone knows the username and password to a different Mac on the network they still won't be able to share this screen because they need to know the password of this machine so at the moment I am the only one on the planet that knows the password to this Mac mini therefore as per these settings I am the only one on the planet that could share the screen so that is absolutely fine that is all the options that we need to um, enable in there there are a few other options that you can delve into if you like but I'm just showing you exactly what I set up in the most easy way next one is the most important setting of the whole shebang and this is file sharing File sharing is basically what will allow you to use this as a file server across all of your computers in the house. As soon as I checked that box, this Mac became instantly available for file sharing. I could go over to my other system and I could access it right now and save files to it. Because again, I know the username and password. There's a little bit of a theme running here. Make sure that when you choose your password, you'll remember it and you can type it in quickly because unless you want to save it in your keychain on another system, you're going to want to remember that so you can, you know, access it quickly. So by doing this, the default settings here dictate that you will need the username and password to access files. Once, once you're in, you're in. Any drive connected to the Mac Mini or any piece of data on the Mac Mini, you can read and write. So down here, we are looking at a specific area where you can add and remove folders. At the moment, the only folder in there is the public folder. I personally don't use the public folder, but if you want to use it, you can see the permissions of various people here, which you can add and remove it's all extremely simple just like how we added and removed user accounts you can see that admin one can read and write and staff and everyone is read only so you can add folders here for specific permissions for specific people that could come in handy if I wanted to share uh, one or two folders from the Mac mini with Jess and she could access it without using a password that would be great can certainly be handy for certain things but in this basic setup we don't need to use it right now in options you will see a, cu a couple of default options selected. I believe this is how it ships. This is a, a clean user account, so at least it should be. You've basically got two file sharing systems here. You've got AFP, which is Apple File Protocol, and this is your Mac to Mac file sharing. And then SMB, I believe, is pretty much for Windows sharing. So if I didn't care about Windows sharing at all, I believe I'd turn off SMB entirely, and then I wouldn't be able to uh, file share with a Windows PC. I don't do it often, but I'll leave it on anyway um, because it's of no harm to leave on and then if I want to access my Mac Mini through Windows I can do so. Next one in the list we will also be checking this is printer sharing. This is all we've got to do now because what we'll do is we'll actually connect the printer to the Mac Mini um, before we go any further into this option so printer sharing is something that I'll be doing. Remote login we're not going to use it for now so don't worry about that. Remote management we're not going to use it for now so don't worry about that. Same goes for this one, same goes for this one. Internet sharing is a very handy option if you don't have the router or whatever close to you then you can route the internet in and out. So let's say for instance you only have access to a wireless connection up in your bedroom or whatever and I know a lot of people have this you know their routers downstairs so your computers are connected via Wi-Fi you can then um, share your internet connection so you can grab your internet connection Wi-Fi in the list here and you can share it out through Ethernet and then you could put a switch on that and you could basically distribute internet um, through Ethernet around your room or whatever to devices that don't have Wi-Fi or whatever but yeah I'm getting sidetracked I don't use that now that's fine I've got a big gigabit switch and stuff same goes for Bluetooth I don't use it we're not going to use it there we go they're all the things that we need enabled right now so a couple of other little things to look out for on this system would be to turn the airport off um, it's turned off already for some reason but it would be uh, a shame to leave the airport on and then if the Mac mini does connect by the airport if it knows your password so if you haven't done a fresh install then uh, you obviously want it to use the wired network so just turn the airport off completely it makes life a lot easier and then notifications we want to turn these off as well I've just reminded myself about something going into the notifications here um, 
I spoke about iCloud and how it can be quite inconvenient. I should have straight away gone into internet accounts. I'd like you to take a little look. Ah, yeah, it hasn't done it. Okay, yeah. So something to, something to keep in mind with iCloud is I have had it in the past and I've recorded this video twice now so it did do it the first time it hasn't done it this time so it's clearly remembered when I first signed up with iCloud on this machine or logged into iCloud rather it took my Google information from my other Apple devices and put my two Google email addresses or my Google accounts in this list and things like mail and calendar they were all checked so personally I don't want any kind of calendar or whatever on this system so I didn't want it to be syncing up I don't want to use it it's not something I care about so I wanted all of that removed and then in the iCloud settings itself we should be able to delve in aha here we go finally so you can see all of these options are checked we can uncheck a lot of these options because I'm not actually using it as some kind of main machine it doesn't make you know it doesn't make sense to have all of this stuff syncing up to the mini or whatever so uncheck all of those um, iCloud keychain is fine, iCloud drive is fine. So iCloud, that's just something to keep in mind. Keep it reined in a little bit and you don't want things syncing up and wasting drive space or you just don't want things displaying. You know, I, I'm not too sure what iCloud does. It's a little bit of a little bit of a beast that is kind of hard to tame in my opinion when you fiddle around with so many different Macs and whatnot. Um, and then on top of all of that, the, no the notifications, as I mentioned earlier, just getting on top of these to make sure that you don't get notified of new email and stuff, because that would not be cool on the server. It might sit in the rack making noises. You don't want that. So there we go. I've literally got no notifications set up. They're all set to none, which is the way we want it. Uh, yeah, and that's pretty much everything. Unless I'm forgetting something crazy obvious, I believe we are set up for now. So, next up, we are going to look at iTunes. So, here we have my iTunes drive. Now, I am going to be changing this up, but most of you know if you've been watching my channel, for a little while I've been storing my iTunes library on this Western Digital 2.5-inch portable drive. Now, what we want to do is use iTunes with our server so that we can access our iTunes content all over the home. Now this drive normally sits in here. When I've got my new Mac Mini set up and everything up and running, I'll be cloning this to a much quicker drive and then I will use this simply as a backup. The reason that I like having a portable drive with my iTunes library on is so that I can whip it out of the rack and take it with me in my bag. If I want to take my laptop with me, I've got all of my media with me, um, which comes in handy. So, you know, that's one very good thing. This will be a clone, so it'll still work as an iTunes drive standalone. Um, but I'm going to show you guys how to configure iTunes with a completely fresh system uh, on a server and the benefits of doing that. So let's pop the drive there and plug it in and I'll jump back into a screen recording highly professionally. So as you guys can see our media drive has displayed on the desktop and this has just reminded me of another thing. One thing that I love to do on all of my Macs and especially handy on servers is jump into the finder preferences and go straight for the general here and just enable everything to show up on the desktop straight away and I think this is much easier. I also do it with a finder window. I think that you know in, in the aim to be really simple um, there's just not enough information displayed in the sidebar and whatnot so I like to see all of my drives and all of my file folders in the sidebar and I also like to flip them around so that I get all of my devices at the top and I can see them when I first open up my Mac mini uh, so you guys can see you know the QuickTime screen recording files that I've been saving and stuff like that so um, Let's have a little look. What were we going to do? Ah, yes, iTunes. So here's my media drive, and on my media drive, I have my iTunes library. Here is my iTunes library. I have all of my media and everything here on this little drive. So one big mistake that people make when it comes to transporting iTunes media from one computer to another and migrating their library is... On their new system, they'll open up iTunes and it'll be all fresh and it'll ask them to make a library and then they start dragging in their media, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay. So, that's not what we want to do. We want to agree to the software terms and conditions, otherwise we're not going to get very far. Let's wait through the little beach ball. 
Okay, so iTunes welcome wizard, we don't care about it, we don't want to set up a library, we, we don't want to do any of that. We're going to quit out of that. Now there's a little magic trick. If you hold down the option key on your keyboard and click on the iTunes logo, it does something very special. It asks you to choose an iTunes library, so naturally we're going to choose library. Now, of course, we've already got an iTunes library. I've already had an iTunes library for, what, 12 years? So we're gonna go to that same library that I've been working very hard on for pretty much most of my life, select iTunes, and it'll show you the one file that you have to select. It's a .itl, .itunes library file, iTunes library .itl. Click on it, press open, and your iTunes library will be restored on this new system pretty much, or exactly identically to how you last left it. Okay, agree, and boom, it shows me my latest purchase, which was the Terminator soundtrack. I haven't purchased a lot recently, but this is my iTunes library with all of my playlists and all of my media, so even we have, forgetting how to use iTunes for a minute, we have films and TV shows and audio books and basically everything in your iTunes library you now have. Now then folks, there is another quick little thing that you have to do, iTunes preferences, and this is important, sharing. The way that I'm going to run my iTunes library is very easy to understand. There are basically two ways in which you can host an iTunes library from a machine. You can host the data on the machine and then open your library fresh each time on a different computer when you want to access it. That's how I used to do it on my old Mac Mini because I had to do it that way because I couldn't run the latest version of iTunes. But now I get the luxury of being able to share my iTunes library. So that means by checking these boxes and you know updating play counts that's fine requiring password I can save it in my keychain that's completely fine share entire library that's an option that you want by doing this I can access my iTunes library that's on the Mac mini from all of my devices even all of them simultaneously if I wanted to there are no restrictions as far as I'm aware so all I've got to do is keep an iTunes window open keep it running and I can access all of my stuff which is something that I've been desperate to do and I'm looking forward to showing that to you guys on my other system in just a second. So making sure all of those options are checked. I believe it saves your preferences in the iTunes library file so that's why they're saved I think. Uh, but iTunes is there. You could even hide it if you don't want. Just make sure that it's still open and there's iTunes. You can get to it if you want but it's completely out of the way. You're never going to need it on your server desktop and that is pretty much it for configuration until we slot it into the rack. Very very basic. There are obviously still more things that you could do such as things that would reflect your personal preferences like the dock for instance or the wallpaper. So that is it folks, configured and ready to go. Let's check out the next step of the video. So I have literally just stopped recording. I've done nothing since all of the configuration has been done and we're going to go over here and I'm going to show you guys in real time what that has allowed us to do. So. We're on a system here that's on the same network, of course. This is my main system. Let me type in my password. So I've got myself permanently zoomed in here so we can all see. If I go into the finder, first things first, look at that column. We have my old server, Neptune, but we also have Venus. Everybody always makes jokes about this one, by the way. Plus Net Hub 1, okay? Plus Net Hub 1. Ugh. Anyway, Venus, that's our new Mac Mini. But not connected it says. That's okay, we've got two buttons, we set these up earlier, connect as. Now by default this will ask you uh, for your name and password. Now it's easy to think that Tom and type of password log in but the username is not Tom on the Mac Mini, it's the username for that system, that's the one we want. So admin1 and my password. Now because this is my desktop and nobody else uses it and you know I don't want to type in my password every time, remember this password in my keychain and connect, bang. And if you guys check out what we get now, we get this. So we have admin one. This is the home folder of the user. So that shows your desktop documents, downloads, movies, etc. Next up, we have the public folder, which we saw earlier. And as you can see, when you click on a folder, it mounts that 
as a drive on the desktop. It mounts that as a directory, so we can now access the admin one home folder, or we could quite happily eject it if you don't need it. You can mount the drive separately, so there's two drives in the Mac Mini. One is Macintosh HD. If I click on it, you can see it's mounted it because it has an eject symbol. It showed up on my desktop, Macintosh HD. If I want to access that second drive, I can click on it, it mounts it straight away, and check this out. Here are my screen recordings. So naturally when I go to edit this video, I'll just grab them straight off the server. So this is our home server fully functioning already, and you've seen every step of the way configuration. So here are the screen recordings. Let's just skip down to sort of a little bit the way through one of them. There you go, that's where I was chatting about iTunes. This is where I was chatting about adding stuff on the desktop. It's all good. There it is, working flawlessly coming from the Mac Mini. And then last but not least, we have all of the external drives that are connected. At the moment, it's just the iTunes drive. We have media. So yeah, there's that one. That works. So file sharing, set up and running, working. I get loads of questions about it. That's how easy it is in the Mac world. But we're not done quite yet. Let's check out the next ne bleh, bleh, next option, screen sharing. So for screen sharing, there are a few different ways you can access it. Personally, I have it as an application in my dock. You can find it in your applications folder. It's in utilities, I think, or somewhere around there. Um, either way, I launch it that way, but you can also launch it from the finder. So Venus, share screen. And then what it does is connecting to Venus and it will ask us, this is the first connection, so it'll take a little while probably to connect. There we go, folks. After a little bit of beach balling and whatnot from my system here, it popped right up. And because I'd saved my uh, password in the keychain, it didn't even ask me to log in. So now every time I want to screen share to Venus, it's as simple as going into screen sharing, connections, open Venus, and it is right there. And as you guys can see, it's pretty much buttery smooth over the gigabit network. So here's a finder window and you can do everything that you would normally do. So you, there's really no need to have a keyboard and mouse and monitor connected, just a waste of space. So I find screen sharing very, very reliable. Um, I've never really had any issues with it. It works just fine. So that is a demonstration of that. So the next demonstration is one of, what else do we shut up? Uh, shut up, set up. iTunes, of course, okay. So iTunes, let's have a little look. Let's launch iTunes. Now, the last library that I was using was indeed that library that I have connected to the Mac Mini, but it was connected to this Mac Mini in a very different way iTunes wasn't launched, and let's just check, iTunes is indeed still launched on this system, good. Didn't know if I'd accidentally closed it or whatever. So we'll hit OK, and in this one, we're obviously going to have to just uh, create a library for now, that's fine. So at the moment, it looks like the same library, but it's not. This is just my purchases showing up because I'm logged in on this computer. This is all local, so you'll be able to see that there's no... Uh, there's no movies or anything, oh, unless I seem to have purchased Ted in the past and it's on the cloud for whatever reason. No TV shows. Uh, but, as you can see in this list, a magic uh, different option appears. Tom Smith's library. That is the Mac Mini, so it's asking for a password. So, now we have my library loaded. So, if we just make it a little bit bigger. This is just like having the library there locally, but it's coming through that Mac Mini. So we have it selected up here in the top. Uh, music, Tom Smith's library. We could browse down to movies and TV shows. That wouldn't make much of a difference at all. We can watch them all. And we've got all of my playlists, everything there exactly the same. Um, let's just play something to test it out. Let's play some of the Doom 64 soundtrack because that probably won't get any strikes. It's just droning and moaning and groaning. Let's turn it up. And as you can see, uh, it works super quickly. Let's scroll down a bit. You can see it's loading the artwork fairly quickly considering it's just a little USB drive on a USB 2.0 uh, interface. That will go quicker, but you know, it's, it's loading great. So let me demonstrate some added beauty of doing it this way. Now let's move this machine out the way for now and open up my MacBook Pro. Now before, what would happen was I'd have my iTunes library files stored on the server, but 
I'd have to load it as an actual library. So once this system had opened it, I would either not have the option of opening it on another system at all, or streaming it downstairs at all, unless I left this system on. Unless there was a computer on, I couldn't access the library via Apple TV or via my phone or anything. So check it out, folks. Random library here with like one track in it or something. Tom Smith's library, enter the password. I have my iTunes library open on my MacBook Pro. So iTunes library open there, iTunes library open here, and also being streamed from there. So let's do a little test on here, why not? Let's do GoldenEye 007. Is that a quiet track? Oh, my volume is down quite substantially. Ah, whoops, I'm playing that down in the kitchen. I wasn't meant to do that. Computer internal speakers. <laughs> there we go. That's better. So GoldenEye playing here. And Doom 64 playing over here. So. And this is the beauty of it. This is why it's worth it. I've been waiting so long to have that set up, so when I throw the Mac Mini into my rack, I can access that from anywhere. And the beauty of it is, right folks, I get my MacBook Pro and I can sit with it on the settee and I can use the iTunes interface here to pick music and stuff, but I could send that to the kitchen or I could send that to my home receiver uh, via the Apple TV or whatever. It's just... Marvellous. I can do it to my receiver directly. Anyway, if I network the receiver, but the interface is a bit... Uh, so, if you're still an iTunes user, definitely recommend doing the last little few steps of this tutorial. But there we go. That's that set up. So all we have left to do now is slot it into the rack, make sure the printer works, make sure it talks to all my hard drives, and then off-camera I've got to do the very boring and tedious task of resetting up all of my storage options uh, in terms of the backups and stuff. But... Yeah, there's no point showing you guys that because that's going to be different for everyone. I've got excitement. Excitement is, is flowing and building. It's working. Cool. Here we have my old faithful and what we're going to do is shut it down. You can see one drive missing. That's the media drive. We're going to come up here to Apple, shut down, shut down. And that'll be that. There it goes, shutting down and it'll lose connection and it'll be off. And that is that retired. If I run into an issue with the new one, because obviously running 24 hours a day, they've sort of got to prove themselves. It's got to be running for a good two, three weeks before I start to accept that it's going to be okay. And then once it gets through that, I'm happy. So it'll take a little while to shut down because it's got a lot of drives connected. And any minute. We can also shut this one down next boot up will indeed be in the rack very exciting very exciting indeed and that one is powered down let me grab the tripod really sorry about the poor lighting in this part of the video folks there's not a lot i can do but i can indeed unplug the mac mini now what we're going to do is just plug the same cables back in bar this one this is a firewire 400 cable we are going to swap it out for a Firewire 800 cable because at the moment that one is just an adapter cable. It goes up to a Firewire 800 plug anyway. I'm going to check to see if these power bricks are the same. If I can get away with using the same power brick, that would be grand. And I'm going to have to do a little bit of recabling work off camera because these are indeed tied in a couple of different places. That's okay though. I'm just going to also have to find a Firewire 800 cable. So. We may be back at a little later time. I can't believe it, folks. I don't have another 800-800. I've got two being used in the rack at the moment, and I've got a Firewire cable here, but it's a 400 to 400. I've also got a couple of spare 400 to 800 adapters, but I don't have an 8 to 8. I know there may be one up in my old home studio, but nope, I officially don't have one here, guys. So that means this video is going to have to be put on hold, I reckon. And um, I'm going to have to finish it at a later date, which will probably be fine anyway, because I don't want to rush things. I was going to try and rush the edit now and get this video out, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take my time, 
wait until I find a fire wire cable and then we can all put it in the rack together and that will be very exciting. So, as you guys can see, my cable organisation box is indeed working well. All of the cables are much more organised, but still doesn't mean that magic cables are going to appear if I don't own them, which is a little bit sad. doesn't matter how many cables you own, there's always going to be that one cable that you don't have when you need it at a certain time for a certain project, which is a massive pain. Alright folks, it's a few days later and we've done a weird YouTube time travel thing, because in the meantime I've made a video about another Mac Mini that you guys have seen, so it's all a little bit confusing, but here is the Mac Mini that we're focusing on in this video of course. It's currently set up and powered on, and it's been like this since I created the previous video a little while ago, so um, I'm pretty happy with the fact that it's been running stably. Every time that I access it, it's ready to rock and um, ready to accept whatever I throw at it. It's just hooked up via power and network. I've got a temporary network feed running out of the front of the rack over to here. Um, now, I'm going to carry on with the integration. I haven't got the cable that I need, but what I've decided is I'm going to temporarily borrow the FireWire 800 to FireWire 800 cable that is linking this guy and this guy, because this is simply a backup drive. It's a load of partitions for different, um, the different Max running time machine. And I've still got this guy going and this guy going. So at the moment, there's a 400 to 800 cable from this guy, which I had to put back in because I just needed some of these files. Um, from this guy to this guy, and then 800 to 800 from this guy to this guy. So we'll borrow that 800 to 800. We'll replace that in the future um, because I just haven't been able to obtain a FireWire 800 cable. I haven't been up to my parents' house. I haven't been anywhere with a shop. And I haven't been able to bring myself to order one. Um, because I know that I own multiple FireWire 800 cables. Um, so yeah, I really need to resolve this issue of half of my stuff being in a completely different location. But today we're going to continue with the swap. But I'm just going to remind myself of everything that I've done by editing the first half of this video. So definitely very confusing YouTube time travel. I've got myself a chocolate croissant and also a lovely coffee. And I'm going to edit the first half. And that way... I'll know what I'm doing. Well, folks, if you're still watching, all I can say is well done. This video is about three times the length I thought it was going to be. Um, so if any of you are still watching, then thank you. Um, you must be big fans. I'm just doing a final render on the screen recorded footage because obviously it's a different res to my sequence here. And um, yeah, a lot of time has passed. That took substantially more time than I thought it would. So I need to now go and cook some food for the fam and eat some food. And uh, yeah, that Mac Mini is going to have to wait. Maybe I'll get it done today. Maybe I won't. But uh, either way, I've made good progress with this video. And it's only a case of slotting the Mini into the rack, doing a tiny bit of cabling, and then one last check and we can sign off. So, not long to go, folks. Okay, folks, I am back, and we are going to nail completion of this video within the next half an hour or so. Um, so, here we have the old Mac Mini. I am basically going to do some cable trimming. Uh, you guys won't be able to see very clearly, but I've got all of the cables that would plug into the Mac Mini in kind of like a cable-tied snake. So I've got to do a little bit of chopping. Um, I know if you, maybe someone will comment on the whole Velcro tie thing, but I addressed the, the Velcro thing in the networking video quite clearly and um, explained why I enjoy the classic zipper-style zip-tie cable tie, um, even though you've got to cut them in scenarios like this. But that's just a little side note. I'm going to shut this one down. I'm actually going to shut both Mac Minis down. That's a good place to start because they're both active. Just making sure iTunes starts up when the machine starts up. Uh, there we go. I've put it in my login items. So that should be grand and good to go. And we are pretty much there, folks. So we're going to shut down this one. This, of course, is the new one. Apologies for the noise outside. It's just some kids playing down the road. And, of course, we have Neptune. So... Let's shut Neptune down. And that should see us right for a little while. So that's the old Mini out. I've cut both the cable ties. And here's the new Mini ready to go in. Now all I've got to do is, as you guys can see, I've got a nice lot of length on all these cables here. So it's made my life 
a lot easier. Um, I've just got to grab this guy. This guy is the one we're removing. This is the Firewire 400 cable. And we've just got to re-jig the other ones so that it, the I get an 800 to 800 into this box because this is the most crucial box. Our Mini is indeed connected with power, Ethernet, Firewire 800, USB for my 3 terabyte hard drive, USB for the printer and USB for this 3.5 inch hard drive dock down the bottom. Um, I got really, really lucky. Turns out this external hard drive was connected with this Firewire cable, so it meant that I didn't have to go delving into the back of this. This was the last thing in the chain, or the second thing in the chain, um, because this drive isn't currently hooked up. I went, yeah, I unplugged the 800 from here, and then of course that could be plugged straight into the Mac Mini, so that was really easy to root into this snake. Um, it, saved me delving right at the back of this because this goes really deep into the rack so that was easy. I've dressed this with two ties all I need to do now is lift up the Mac Mini sort of balance it on my leg while I anchor this cable snake to the back of the shelf with another cable tie and we are ready to rock and of course the one thing that isn't plugged in at the moment is my iTunes drive but as you guys know that doesn't become part of the snake. Another benefit with this Mac Mini I get an extra USB port so that is really handy. I was completely full up before. Um, I do have a Mac Mini USB hub but I don't think it would fit under the Mini in this particular rack shelf size. So um, yeah we're nearly there. So folks moment of truth. First boot of the Mac Mini in its new home. Here we go. There was an extremely quiet bong there folks. I promise I heard it. And there we go. Both of these hard drives are indeed powered up. So that is good stuff from the Mac Mini there. It is currently booting up. It looks absolutely fantastic in its new home. Very pleased. You guys would not believe how quick that sprung into life and booted up. We've got Venus. I'm currently, um, I've just copied a, whoops, I clicked on the wrong one just copied a file over to my Monster Raid. I've just copied a five gig file and uh, that was the video of the previous Mac Mini and that worked really well. I booted up iTunes, it found my library straight away and it's playing back perfectly. Which is fantastic and also what I notice is it's a lot quicker than the previous model. I don't know why, I think that's because the library was stored on the Mac Mini before and you know it was trying to shunt the entire thing over, over the network but this is just sharing so it's actually a lot more fluid to search for things and whatnot um, but something that I thought I'd leave until we were all together on camera was the disk speed test for my Monster Raid. Now just to give you guys a bit of context if you didn't see my previous setup the Monster Raid box, the um, Raid 5 enclosure over there it's got three used, uh, sorry, four used Western Digital drives in it that I bought off eBay. And uh, I've been very, very lucky. I bought them on a whim really quickly when I got my hands on the enclosure. And I did mean to replace them, but they've been rock solid. Um, touch wood. But, you know, I will replace them in the future for some bigger drives, for some more storage. But I've been limited by the speed of Firewire 400. That's been the bottleneck because that's the way it was connected to my Mac Mini. So let's see how quick we get now. We get a write of about 40, 50 megabytes a second and a read of uh, 20, yeah, 30 megabytes a second. So I have to admit, folks, I was thinking that the Firewire um, interface, the Firewire 400 interface was a little bit more of a bottleneck than it actually was maybe. Um, this is only marginally quicker than it used to be, but it's fine. It is completely fine. Um, the box is, is for storage. I don't, you know, live edit back and forth to it, so that's fine speed. It just took a few minutes to transfer over that 5 gig file absolutely fine. It also has eSATA. I'd assume it'd be a little bit quicker over eSATA, but maybe not. Maybe I need to get some new drives in there and see how the enclosure performs with some new drives, but it is a little bit of a piece of sort of crappy um, equipment. You know, it's not really designed for the purpose that I'm using it for. Uh, but we now have a Firewire 800 bus for all of my external drives, so they'll all speed up, uh, all three of them that are on there. 
so very much looking forward to that once I get the cabling sorted. And uh, one, there's one more thing that we've got to do before I sign off, otherwise I know people will be upset if I leave a loose end. One thing we didn't do was install the printer driver on my Mac Mini. Uh, now my printer is actually out of ink, so we won't really be able to test anything properly, but what I will do is install the printer driver and then show you guys that my system here sees the printer via the Mac Mini. Talk of the devil, as soon as I load up screen sharing, it asks me if I want to install the drive of my printer. I'm gonna tick install. Time Machine has popped up. I'm gonna say don't use for now because I'm gonna to need to set all that up very, very carefully um, pretty soon. So this is system preferences on my Mac here in front of me. Um, I know it's a little bit confusing with the windows. All you do is jump into printers plus and as soon as the driver is installed on the Mac Mini and printer sharing is enabled, it'll see it. It'll see the printer. And yeah, that is pretty much it. Add. And it'll add the printer to the list. And obviously, if the printer switched on, it'll give you the little green blob and it'll just say that it's idle. In terms of the settings on the Mini itself, after you've installed the printer driver, of course, it'll display in its list of printers. But if we come down to sharing, Printer sharing is enabled that we enabled earlier. Um, it's automatically set up for everyone to be able to print. You can change this. You can add, obviously, admin one, um, administrators, all sorts of different options, but I've just got it set to everyone. Um, if my printer ever starts spewing out random documents one day, I'll know why. <laughs> but um, there we have it, folks. My printer's in the list. And uh, that is it for the configuration of the printer. That's all you have to do. So I'm sure you guys have been able to tell by now that this is an extremely easy process. We could print right now if we wanted to, um, but as I say, I don't have much ink uh, or any ink, but you can tell that it's all up and running Canon MP250 series at Venus. So this would, this would print just fine. In fact, do you know what? Stuff it. I'm just gonna get a text edit document and we'll send out a bit of paper. If I just do a few spaces, Command P, and as you guys can see, it's the only printer on this machine, so it's the only one selected. If I hit print, just to demo it, why the heck not? Any second that bit of paper will come out of the printer. There we go, printer's woken up. And it's doing its thing. Oh God, a lot of faff with this printer. That's the only thing, few days of not using it and it's gotta go through a right palaver before even firing out a bit of paper. Any second and it'll come out. There we go, there's our bit of paper. So, as you guys can see, that's a fantastic way of, um, if your printer doesn't have network capabilities of its own, and you've got a little um, network machine on the go like I have here, it's a fantastic way of saving yourself a little bit of cash if you don't need to go out and buy a new printer. So, really quickly on my printer story, I don't use a printer that much at all, very, very rarely. A set of ink cartridges will last me about a year and a half, that's how rarely I use my printer. I try and print at work as much as I can for work-related things. I'll just print the odd thing here every now and again. And of course, for someone that uses their printer so little, it wouldn't be viable for me to go out and buy a network printer now that I know, you know, that I know that this one is still completely functional. So connecting it via the Mac Mini makes my life super easy and Jess can print as well. And uh, as you guys can see, it's very easy to set up and it has been, you know, this is nothing new. The OS, you know, I could do this on Tiger. So it's, uh, it's marvelous, it really is. And it's so easy to, to get this all up and running as you guys have been able to see and transferring files, iTunes, printing, screen sharing, all this automated time machine stuff, so easy. And uh, if you guys have any questions, just leave them down in the comment section below. I know it's been a long video. I'm absolutely knackered, you can probably tell. Looking forward to getting this one exporting and hearing what you guys, th what you guys think. If you made it to the end of the video, please leave me a comment and let me know that you made it to the end of the video. And just as a word to those of you, I know I've got a lot of very highly skilled professionals watching my videos. This was just a very basic look into what this stuff can do, you know. I'm not a networking pro, I'm not a server pro by any means. This is just me fiddling about in my room with some of this cool stuff. 
stuff that makes my life quite a bit smoother in terms of using my computers. So I hope somebody out there found this useful and entertaining. And as always, I will see you guys in the next video, which will probably be um, an introduction to the new little man. I really hope so, because if he doesn't come out today or tonight, then they're going to make him come out tomorrow, which is not going to be a fun process in hospital tomorrow. But I'll keep you guys updated as time goes on. Thank you for watching. See you in the next one.